thank all of you for coming tonight. I hope that you've had nearly as wonderful day as I've had uh, here in your beautiful community. How many of you are visiting? You call yourselves visitors. Would you just let me see your hands raised? Thank you. That gives me some idea of who the home folks are. I'm grateful for that. I'm reading tonight from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Thank all of you for coming tonight. I hope that you've had nearly as wonderful day as I've had uh, here in your beautiful community. How many of you are visiting? You call yourselves visitors. Would you just let me see your hands raised? Thank you. That gives me some idea of who the home folks are. And, uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm reading tonight from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he'd chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You've heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let us bow our hearts before him in prayer. We're very grateful that the promise you made to these first disciples applies to us also. That you are the God of all ages. That you are no respecter of persons. And we're so glad to know that what you did, you're doing. What you said, you're saying. What you were, you are and that you are as capable of invading us here tonight as you were that little group of 120. So Lord Jesus, we, many of us have had experiences with you, but we've had enough to know there's more for us. So we're coming hungry. We are longing to be more completely possessed by you. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight who has never known a release of your power in their life, we're praying this will be the night. Help me to be sensitive, 
to have the right thoughts in the proper sequence and the best possible words to express those thoughts. Let the heavy anointing rest upon the service. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ said to this first group of Christians, uh, these who had walked with him for three years, uh, they had learned many different secrets. Uh, they had learned more than the multitudes had learned. Uh, for they had been with him in sessions, in very intimate ways. They knew that he was the Son of God. They knew that he, as was expressed by Nicodemus, was a great teacher sent from God. They knew that he had peculiar power, for they had exercised this power in association with him. Not only had they seen him heal the sick, but in association with him, they had been given power to heal the sick. They knew this man was peculiarly related to God, for he had the power to set them free. They knew that he was the Savior, for they had seen sin-bound souls set free with one word from his lips. They had seen the dead raised just by the command of his voice. They had left all to follow him. They also knew that he was the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, who was slain for man. There was no argument about theology concerning the cross in their minds, for they were there when it happened. They had seen him hanging between heaven and earth. They had seen the sword pierce his side and water run down with blood as Jesus Christ had given his life and in his closing breath had prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. These disciples knew that he had died in their stead. More than this, they knew that he was the resurrected man, the new humanity. These disciples had gone to the tomb. They weren't taking someone else's word about it. They had gone and examined for themselves. And they had seen that he wasn't there. And also these disciples had had Jesus Christ appear to them in many different ways after the resurrection. And if you would like a delightful study in the New Testament, read these post-resurrection appearances. The conditions under which Jesus appears to the disciples, the way in which he makes himself known, it's marvelous to see Jesus Christ appearing this way. And these disciples knew that he was the resurrected Lord. They also knew that he had ascended unto God. They watched him while he went. Now it was to this group who had left all to follow him, who had known his intimate teachings, who knew him to be the crucified one, the resurrected one, the ascended one. It was to these that Jesus said, you are not ready yet to be my disciples. Well, what does it take? Now, if they weren't ready, what would it take to make them ready? So Jesus tells them and tells us, you're not ready yet, he said. I have a promise from the Father that he is going to give to you. And you stay in Jerusalem until this promise is fulfilled. And they said, Jesus, is this going to be what you've been talking about? The coming of your kingdom on earth, are you going to usher in your kingdom now? And Jesus said, look, the consummation of this age is given only to the Father. But I can tell you this. And I'm sure, I'm paraphrasing here, but Jesus said, fellows, do you remember how John baptized people with water? Well, Lord, who could ever forget that? 
These Baptists, the way they baptize. <laughs> John was a Baptist, you see. I'm, I'm not kicking anyone. Uh, how could we ever forget that? Of course we, we remember. Well, uh, Jesus uh, must have had a twinkle in his eye. Uh, for he said, just as John baptized people with water, you're going to be baptized with spirit, with the Holy Ghost. And after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, then it is that you'll have power. And then it is that you'll be witnesses unto me. But you stay in Jerusalem until this has happened. And these 120 disciples stayed there in Jerusalem in an upper room for 10 days after Jesus had given them this commandment. And on the 50th day after the crucifixion, as they were seated together there in this room, and the scriptures do, do not say what they were doing. It does say one time they continued in daily prayer rejoicing in the Lord. So I suppose they were just having a glorious time anticipating what the Lord was going to do. They sure had no precedent established. They had no doctrine to which they were paying lip service. Uh, they had no preconce preconceived idea about what was to happen. They were just waiting on the Lord, knowing that he was going to fulfill his word. And as they sat together, they began to hear a strange noise. This noise sounded like a mighty rushing wind. And they looked and no doors were open, no windows in the place, but here was wind uh, penetrating the walls or something that sounded like wind and moving in their midst. And as they looked at one another, not only did they hear something that sounded like wind, but they had a visual sign. For as they looked at each other, there was something that appeared to be cloven tongues of fire that was, uh, seemed to be established upon each person's head. And they became aware of something happening to them that they knew not what. But as they became aware of this power, suddenly the shackles of fear began to be broken. There was a releasing of the hunger of their soul and they found themselves in a liberty of true worship where each one of them was able to give utterance in terms of their own worship to God in a way that was dictated by this strange power that was infusing them. Have you ever had a real free, full experience of worship before God? Have you ever been able to abandon yourself totally, standing before the living Lord of the universe and knowing that you were having a fulfillment in worship with, with no strings attached? You know, most of us are so tightly laced Spiritually, it's amazing, isn't it, how we bind ourselves before the Lord and just come and sit in our little restricted forms of worship, which is usually flop. <laughs> Whoever said this was an attitude of worship? <laughs> uh, but it's amazing. And yet these first disciples were experiencing a real releasing experience, so much so that they were more concerned with their willingness and ability to worship than they were public opinion. Are you? I'm not always that free. 
Sometimes I'm much more concerned about what other people are say, will say about my worship than I am about the experience of worship. You say, is my robe just right? <laughs> yeah. Are my socks dark? Are the candles flickering just in the right way? Do the ushers hold the plates <laughs> just in the proper way? It's amazing, isn't it, how we become so concerned. And yet here we find this power. And they break out of those room, uh, that room through those doors and rush out into the streets of Jerusalem in front of the temple where people are gathered from all parts of the world, Jewish people, for this Feast of Weeks, Feast of the Harvest. And there they began to praise the Lord in a strange way. For these people gathered from all parts of the world hear these ignorant and unlearned men worshiping God and declaring the marvelous works of God in languages unknown to them, unknown to the ignorant and unlearned men. And they marveled. And they said, look, these fellows are just ignorant Galileans. These uh, uh, fellows here in Jerusalem. They haven't been to these countries, and yet we hear them, every man in his own tongue. Isn't that amazing? And also another strange thing, thing happens. They were so free that the world said, they're drunk. <laughs> I heard this story. A Baptist preacher told me this up in Michigan. He, he said he was pastor in this town, and one day the, he was talking with one of the policemen. And uh, the policeman said to him, uh, Doctor, do you realize that practically everyone down in the jail in our town has a DD after their name? <laughs> <laughs> and the preacher said, No, I, I didn't realize that. And the officer smiled and said, Yes, he does. But said, Down at the jail, it means drunk and disorderly. And then the preacher said, this officer looked at me and said, Preacher, what does it mean after your name? <laughs> uh, but if we were going to give a degree to these early Christians, a DD, it would be drunk and disorderly. And then Peter began to preach. And as he preached, we find another amazing power given to these men. It wasn't all emotional. It was emotional. It was ecstatic. But it was not restricted to the emotion and the ecstasy. For here is sheer genius coming into play and supernatural wisdom as Peter stands to preach and the meaning of scripture that had been hidden from the scribes through the years begins to come as divine insight into Peter's mind. And immediately he sees this is the prophecy of Joel. And reaching back into the scriptures, he begins to unfold the prophecies of old as he stands and preaches with unheard of wisdom. So much so that 3,000 people are converted. Now this is a brief account of the first Pentecost that came to the Christian church. What did it mean and what does it mean? One thing that I find that it means is this. Through the coming of the Holy Spirit, all holy places are fulfilled. You see, prior to this, all through the scripture, you will find these peculiar places where man meets God. Uh, as you follow these nomads through uh, the, the hill country, they made their altars, and they kept coming back to their altars, quite often in the, in the mountains. And then later on, they had their arks, where they carried on their shoulders, and their God was confined in this ark. Then they built the tabernacle, and there in the tabernacle, they had what they called the Holy of Holies, and later translated to the temple. This was where they met God. And when Jesus came in on the scene, 
the, the movement was from place to person. But here at Pentecost, look what happens. An ordinary room, so insignificant that it's not even described. We don't know where the room was. I assume it was John Mark's mother's home where they had so many wonderful meetings there in Jerusalem. But here is an ordinary room where God meets these disciples. And in this invasion, all places in terms of holy places are fulfilled. And in the light of Pentecost, every bush is aflame with the glory of God. Every step you take is holy ground. And you can meet him anywhere or miss him everywhere. Holy places are fulfilled. And any time we begin to feel as if we have to come within the walls of a sanctuary and there's something more holy about this particular carpet than there is the carpet of a living room, we've missed the meaning of, of Pentecost. We've missed the meaning of real worship. Anytime you feel more religious on 11 o'clock Sunday morning than you do at 8 o'clock Monday morning, you've missed the meaning of Pentecost. Here God breaks through traditions and in terms of places and makes himself available everywhere. You see, wherever you are, there he is. Just get at it. Worship him as you are, where you are. This is Pentecost. Another thing that's fulfilled here is, is, the, is the fulfillment of persons in terms of holy people. Now, all through this Bible, you are missing out if you think that every man has the same walk with God. Uh, beginning with the early patriarchs, they are peculiarly set apart by God. The other people worship God, but Moses talked with him face to face. Moses had a walk with God that no one else in the camp had. Same way with these judges and priests and kings. They were peculiarly anointed, and they had insights with God and inroads in terms of the power of God that the common man did not have. It was the same way with Jesus Christ and the twelve. The masses did not have the same teaching as the twelve. The common man did not have the same ministry as the twelve. Jesus Christ gave them a special calling, a special place in terms of his ministry on the level of the incarnation. But not so at Pentecost. The twelve were there, but there were a hundred and eight others. The hundred and eight others were so insignificant that they aren't even named. But they received just as much of the Holy Spirit as the twelve. You see, there's the, in the light of Pentecost, there's no such thing as God playing favorites. The priesthood of all believers comes into fulfillment only at Pentecost. And this is the peculiar doctrine of the Protestant faith. We're saying that every man is a temple of God. Every man is a priest of God. Every man can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we only have one gospel and that applies to the pew in the same way that it does the pulpit. And this is true. There's not a special gospel for me and another gospel for you. I don't have any peculiar power before God that you don't have. You don't have any that I don't have either. In the light of Pentecost, every one of us can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's face it, we all don't have the same talents, the same ability. Everybody's not as pretty as I am. <laughs> uh, but you can take a quart jar and a gallon jar 
and fill them full, and one is as full as the other one. And when you run them over, one can run over as much as the other. And so this is true concerning the Holy Spirit. Our gifts vary in terms of natural aptitudes and abilities. But every one of us can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the glorious gospel. And you can have the power of God in your life as much as the greatest saint who has ever lived. Please know that. I grew up as a preacher's boy. And you let me as a preacher's son and John Brown do something together. Maybe it wasn't right. And you know what everybody said? They'd say, did you hear about John Brown and Preacher Tyson's boy? <laughs> as if I didn't have a right to be as mean as John Brown. Why should I have to be any better than your boy just because my dad is a preacher? You see, that's the sort of thinking that denies the reality of Pentecost. To think there's a special ethic for a preacher. No, it takes just as much grace to save us as it does you. It takes just as much grace to keep us saved as it does you. And so we find all of this in terms of holy persons fulfilled at Pentecost. Now another thing that's fulfilled at Pentecost, and I'll move on, is in terms of method. What about if these disciples had been partaking of the sacrament at Pentecost? Well, we'd have been spoiled forever. We would have felt like we'd had to be on our knees partaking of the sacraments in order to receive the Holy Spirit. What about if it says they were laying hands on one another when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit? We would have felt like we'd have to lay hands on one another. But all the scripture says they were seated together. It doesn't even say how they were sitting. You know there's no such thing as a holy position. It's no more holy this way than it is this way. It's no more holy this way than it is with your hands in your pocket. In terms of worshiping God, the outward actions have very little to do with it. We don't have to climb a ladder and reach God, you see. Oh, our worship is not something we manipulate in order to find favor with God. Here at Pentecost, God has fulfilled methods not by demanding man to come to him, but by, first of all, coming to man. You see, you don't have to go to God. He's already come to you. He comes to you where you are. And so in the light of Pentecost, instead of running around trying to find God, just wait a minute. Let him catch up with you. <laughs> you, say, uh, you just stay where you are a minute. And if you'll be still, you'll find that he's already there. Most people who talk about trying to find God are doing their best not to find him. Read it. This, and you examine your own life when you talk about this. Trying to find God. Well, where are you going to look? You heard the story, didn't you, about the uh, little boy coming home from church. And this town cynic saw the little boy. He thought he'd kid him a little. Said, son, you've been up to church? Said, yes, sir. Well, he said, son, I'll give you a quarter if you'll tell me where God is. And the little boy looked at the cynic and said, mister, I'll give you a dollar if you tell me where he ain't. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so here at Pentecost, uh, in the light of the Holy Spirit, the Lord comes to us where we are. So Stanley Jones is quite right when he says, the Christian gospel is not a series of teachings try telling man how to try to reach God, but it's the proclamation of the fact that God has already reached man. Now, what happened in this reaching? As I mentioned, there were ecstatic experiences related to it. 
there were some things that could not be explained by logic. But even beyond the outward expression of ex ecstasism in terms of tongues and other manifestations, there was a reality that took place within their hearts and at the core of this experience of Pentecost, these disciples knew that not only had Jesus Christ been resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven, but they knew also that this resurrected Lord, Jesus himself, had somehow invaded their lives and had come to live within them. They were conscious of Jesus from within. This is Pentecost. They were aware of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, coming within. I had a letter a few days ago from a minister in France. Uh, he was there in Marseille where I was preaching some weeks ago. And his letter, in essence, said, said this. He said, Brother Tyson, I attended your morning lecture when you were speaking with the preachers. And I had spoken that morning on identification, the oneness that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And he said, as I heard you talk, I knew this was the core of Pentecost. So I came back to the afternoon service. And he said, when you began to preach, I was sitting there with my heart burning within me. Now he said, the Pentecostals had frightened me. They talked about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, but he said, as I looked, I heard more noise than I saw power. And I didn't want what they claimed to have. But he said, as you began to preach, my heart began to burn. And I knew that somehow the Lord had something for me. And he said, as the service continued, all of a sudden as I looked at you, I didn't see you. I saw Jesus Christ within you. And he said, everything within me began to pray that I might know Jesus. And then he said, I don't know how it happened. But all of a sudden, I wasn't looking at you. I was looking over to the side of you. And there stood Jesus beside you. And he said, when I saw Jesus beside you, I closed you out. And I just sat there looking at Jesus and inviting him, if he could, to come and get within me. And he said, Mr. Tyson, I don't know how it happened again. But suddenly I realized that Jesus Christ, whom I'd seen first in you and then beside you, was within me. And he said, when Jesus Christ revealed himself within me, I thought I would burst. And everything within me said, this is the purpose for which you were born, to be in union with Jesus from within. And he said, when, the, when I came into a level of consciousness of my surroundings, you were having the prayers following your preaching. And he said, when I looked up, there was a young man that I had known to be blind all of his life. And you were praying for him. And he said, perhaps what you don't know also is, that young man was healed. I did not know this. But I liked tremendously the description this boy gave of this experience. This is Pentecost, where the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ himself, actually invades infuses, inbreeds, indwells, and comes and takes up his resurrected presence within us. This is what Jesus means when he says, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall have power and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Being a witness unto Jesus doesn't mean merely that you stick your chin out and say, I believe in Jesus. A witness is someone who sees. Well, how do you mean you see witnesses unto me? Well, let me show you how it unfolds to me. You see, there was mortal eye to behold every event in the, in the life of Jesus, save one. 
There was mortal eye there at the manger in Bethlehem. They saw his birth. There was mortal man that beheld with his eye the baptism of Jesus at the, at the River Jordan. There was mortal eye that beheld all of his miraculous ministry. There was mortal eye that beheld his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension. But when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and was crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and all power was given unto him both in heaven and on earth, there was no mortal eye to behold that, the incarnation, I mean the, the, the incarnation of our King. Do you know how you witness this? Through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit baptizes you, you are witnesses to the kingship of Jesus. And you know beyond argument that he's Lord of all. And you become more conscious of the power of God than you are the weakness of man. You become more conscious of the forgiving grace of God than you are the sins of man. You become more conscious of the love of God than you are the littleness of man. You become more conscious of the glory of heaven than you are the depravity of the world. Oh, how this world is hungering for the church to become baptized in the Holy Spirit that we might be witnesses unto Jesus and becoming witnesses unto him we might relate this witness to every man. What do you see when you look around you? Do you see him? Or do you see mere human needs? Well if you're bound by needs you're not at Pentecost. If you're bound by human failure, you're not at Pentecost. If you're bound only by darkness, you're not at Pentecost. The Pentecostal experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is coming into a consciousness of the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ, from within us to such a degree that we are more aware of his victory than we are man's failure. Let me say one other thing, and I'll close and, and, and talk about it some more at another session. Also at Pentecost, we are aware of our personal involvement. We are aware of the fact that God has chosen us to be laborers with him in ushering in the kingdom of God. You know, folks, I'm hungry to see God's kingdom come to earth. I'm not interested in running off going to heaven. Really, I'm not. They've got so many saints in heaven. <laughs> you know, they don't need me. <laughs> they don't need you much. Not in heaven. Heaven needs us here. Heaven needs channels through which it can come to earth. Heaven is looking for instruments that can be used of the Holy Spirit. And when I, really, when I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's the greatest prayer of my soul. I believe in the kingdom of God on earth. And I am glad God waited for me and that he actually has let me have and is letting me have the privilege of helping bring, into, bring in the kingdom. Aren't you? I'm so glad God can take a little old mind like, like mine and begin to flood it with dreams of heaven. I'm glad he can take a swiveled up soul like mine that has been so selfish and so fearful, so cantankerous, and he can explode it with the power of the divine energy of holy love. And somehow even take me and make me want to offer myself and say, Lord, let me be a blessing to every man. I'm glad God can take me 
and somehow use me as a prayer partner. And I can see prayers answered, people healed, people forgiven. I'm glad God has given me the privilege to say to any man, my brother, though your sins be as scarlet, in Jesus there's white as snow. I forgive you. And I'm not going to hold it against you because God has died that you might be cleansed and I'll act like it. Aren't you glad that you can actually manifest forgiving love? Aren't you glad that you can take that which belongs to God and share it with any man? Look, I, this is one of the greatest secrets I've ever discovered because I was always bound by the fear of money. You know, I, I grew up thinking somehow that uh, to be a Christian, you had to be long mouth and poor mouth. And a preacher was just someone that every businessman hated to see come in because you had to give him a discount. <laughs> really, I, I grew up in all this mess. And even after the Lord converted me somewhat and called me into the ministry, I was still bound by fear of money. And I never dared exercise the boldness to tell a church board that I thought they weren't doing me right with God's money. <laughs> yes, I never had the, the boldness to, to tell them I thought that God wanted me to have an increase. So I'd, I'd live in fear. And long toward the uh, fourth quarter of the conference every year, I'd get on the good sides of every board member we had. hoping they'd realize what a jewel they had. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? And then the Lord Jesus Christ began to call me into this work of evangelism. And one thing, the one reason that he did it is because it's an appointment without salary and I needed to face my fears. And do you know how the Lord began to break the fear of finances? By letting me be free to give. Really, this is true. And so I just say, now, Lord, all right, every penny in this pocketbook is yours. And if you don't want me to give it away, you sure better not tell me. And I'd, get, I'd be walking down the street, and I'd see a man, an idea would come to me. This man needs a little money. Why don't you take some of the Lord's money and give it to him? And if you really want to get in, get in glory, especially when you're about broke <laughs> and think you can't afford it, that's when the Lord really delights to do something, when you think you can't afford it. And you just began to share in the name of the Lord. And you, as you share in the name of the Lord, it'll just come back to you pressed down and running over. And I'm discovering this over and over and over. And I could spend the rest of the night giving you one il illustration after another about what I'm discovering in terms of this one release of power and I'm so glad, and you'll never get any poor mouth out of me. Really, I'm as rich as any man in the universe. I'm serious about this. And I've oversold it in terms of my family. My daughter was going off to college this fall, and I was watching her pack, wishing she'd hurry so we could go ahead. And as I, I looked at her and saw all those clothes, I said, darling, Really, if, if I didn't know it better, I'd say that your daddy was a rich man. And she looked up from packing and winked at me and said, you're the one that's taught me my father's a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you know, I can't tell you how glad I was to have one of my children catch that. Anytime a Christian sells anybody else on the idea that there's something virtuous about being poor, send them to me. <laughs> there's no virtue in poverty that I know of. This is true. And so I'm finding that God lets me know he's my richness. Now, I, I don't have a, a savings account. I don't need one. And you know how the Lord taught me that? I was trying to get him to get me enough money so I could have a little savings account. <laughs> and Francis and I were putting some corn up in the freezer. And I was sitting there shaving corn. 
and talk with the Lord about having something in the savings account. <laughs> and the Lord said, what are you doing, son? <laughs> and I said, Lord, we're putting corn in the freezer, deep freeze. Uh, and this thought came back, well, why are you putting it in the deep freeze? Well, I said, Lord, because this is the growing season now. And this season is going to move into fall and into winter when nothing grows. And everything will be uh, dead. And so I'm saving up this corn for a time when productivity is cut off. He said, is that the reason you need a savings account? Because you're afraid you'll get to a winter season in your soul? And I'll not be able to produce. And I said, yes, Lord, that's the reason. It's a lack of faith. Forgive me. <laughs> you said, uh, so I don't need a savings account. He's my savings. All I need to do is learn to spend the money he gives me. Just give it away in his name. And this has set me free. And this has followed in terms of the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm so glad I can help bring in the kingdom. I don't know how many missionaries have been blessed through, through us. As the Lord has said, send this check to a mission fee. I don't know how many, I haven't kept account. I don't know how many starving babies have been fed because God said to me, you've got some of my money I want you to send to India. But aren't you glad that you can be used to bring in the kingdom? And so Pentecost has to do with a personal involvement where we become laborious together with God in bringing all things under the domain of his redemptive grace. Yes, there's ecstasy. Yes, there are experiences that make, will make you look foolish in the eyes of the world who do not understand. But even in the midst of the ecstatic and the frivolous, and the foolish, there's the core of reality of a marriage of love with the risen Lord within your life where you become one with God through Jesus Christ. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Let us pray. Thou didst say, Lord, that we should be baptized with the Spirit even as John baptized with water. To those of us who have not yet been baptized, we are conscious of need. To those of us who have been baptized, we are conscious of a deeper work that needs to be done. Let not this be a mere lecture just giving some words about a historical experience. Oh, Jesus, let this be a time of opening the floodgates of heaven within our minds, spirits, and bodies that we shall claim that heritage that has been provided for by your own grace. Amen.